Hey guys! So, the SAT math modules can be daunting, so in the next few videos I'm going to go over 10 essential things you need to know for the math section to succeed. This obviously isn't a comprehensive guide on everything that'll appear on the SAT math section, but if you can do the 10 things that I'm going to talk about, you're most of the way there. Once you master these, it's all about small improvements that can help tweak and refine your score, and learning the more complicated topics that'll only show up a few times. We're going to go over an example problem for every common topic, and I'll also give you some topic-specific tips for each one. I'll also go in order of most important to least important to know, and what's most likely to appear. This is meant to give you a little taste of almost everything you'll encounter on the SAT, so you can see if there are any gaps in your knowledge. And if there are, you can go to Khan Academy to watch videos on these topics on their digital SAT course, or you can learn with Aisley, sponsored to this video. Aisley is a tool that's completely changed the way I think about SAT prep. It's an AI-powered platform that takes all the guesswork out of studying for the SAT. Whether you need a tailored study plan based on your test date and your target score, or you need detailed help with a really tough problem, Aisley's got you covered. What I love about it is you can ask it anything about a problem, just like ChatGPT. And it doesn't just give you the answer, it breaks it down step by step for you. And if you're like me and you struggle with some of the answer explanations that College Board will give you in their test prep packages, Aisley can give you even better answer explanations than College Board can, tailored exactly to how you learn. You can choose to follow the method that makes the most sense for you, which is a game changer because everyone learns differently. What really makes Aisley stand out in my mind, though, is how it helps you review your mistakes. You all know that one of my biggest tips is to really carefully review every single mistake you make and try to prevent yourself from making that mistake in the future. And Aisley can really help you do this. It doesn't just point out the mistakes you're making, it compiles them all into one place so you can revisit them very easily, and it'll keep you engaged by letting you ask questions as you review your mistakes. So you're not just passively going over them and saying, oh, I won't make that mistake again. You're actively learning. It's like having a personal tutor on standby, but it's way more affordable and available whenever you need it. And did I mention it was designed by Stanford grads? It's also fully updated for the digital SAT, so you know that you're going to be studying with the most relevant material that's out there. If you want to check it out, use the link in my description below, where you can get $10 off your first month with Aisley. So let's give a huge thanks to Aisley for sponsoring this video. So now let's get into the 10 most important concepts to master for the SAT math section, and go over some examples for every single one. So the first topic is by far the most prevalent topic that appears on the SAT. I've actually broken it up into topics 1 and 2 because it shows up that much. So this topic is linear equations. So first, you need to know how to graph these. y equals mx plus b is the most important equation on the entire SAT. So you have your x and y axis like this, and to graph x versus y, or something versus time, you can use the slope m and the y-intercept b. So they'll ask you to interpret what the elements of these graphs mean, or ask you to plot data in this form. So to get slope and y-intercept straight, the slope is how much something is increasing per unit of x and the y-intercept is where you're starting from. So let's go through an example. So as you can see here, we have the x-axis and the y-axis, or the horizontal and vertical axes, and we have the line starting at a certain value, and it's linear, it's increasing a certain amount. We don't have any values for this problem and we don't need them, but we see that this graph represents the total charge in dollars by an electrician for x hours of work. So this axis is the hours. The electrician charges a one-time fee which would be represented by the y-intercept, since it only happens once, and then an hourly rate. So the hourly rate is how much gets charged per hour. So remember that the intersection with the y-axis is the y-intercept, and how much it's increasing per time is the slope. So if there's an hourly rate, that's increasing per time. So that would be the best representation of the slope. The one-time fee would be best for the y-intercept, since that's how much it starts at. The maximum that the electrician charges would make sense if the graph looked more like a quadratic, where there was a very clear maximum point, and the total amount would be the area under the curve. It would be that entire amount that gets charged under this triangle for a given amount of time. But yeah, the one that matches best with the slope is the hourly rate, and that same pattern will follow for all of these type of problems. So if you see something per time, it's usually going to be the slope. If you see some one-time fee or starting value, that's going to be the y-intercept. So, you should know that the function just is the same as y, basically, in the case of the SAT, with a little bit more nuance. So, we can still represent this equation in terms of y equals mx plus b, or in this case, f of x equals mx plus b. So we're trying to find the value of f of x, or basically y, when x equals 4. In this case, 
our slope is 7, our y-intercept is 2. So if we write out this equation that we're given, we can just plug in a 4 wherever we see an x and solve for what f of x would be, or f of 4. So this would be 28 plus 2, or 30. So that's f of x when x equals 4. Inequalities are another variation on this. They don't come up too much and can also just usually be treated like equations to solve for a minimum or maximum value instead of the exact value. Now you might also see this as an inequality, but don't get scared. It's basically just the same as an equation, but with a maximum or minimum value instead of being exactly equal. So let's write out our y equals mx plus b again and try to figure out how this would look. So we have a $25 service fee. That sounds like a starting cost. So that would be our y-intercept. And then $10 per hour, that's our slope, equals y. But in this case, it's going to be an inequality because they need to spend a maximum of $75 to rent their surfboard. So they don't want to go over that value. So basically, it has to stay less than or equal to 75. And in this case, they use the variable t as x since they're working in time. But don't let that throw you off too much. So our final inequality looks like that or d if we rearrange it a little. Now the next topic is solving equations and order of operations things. So you'll need to know how to solve linear equations and occasionally even nonlinear equations. So if we're trying to solve for x, how do we do that? We can follow the reverse order of operations or reverse PEMDAS. So first you're going to add or subtract on both sides of your equation, then multiply or divide on both sides, then deal with all the exponents, and finally deal with what's inside of the parentheses and that will help you isolate x. So let's see how this works. So this is probably the most basic PEMDAS problem that you'll see. Let's just rewrite it out here. So since we're trying to solve for x, we're going to use reverse PEMDAS. So first we do our subtraction and addition. So let's subtract 5 from both sides. We get 4x equals 160. And then we do our multiplication and division. So we'll divide by 4 on both sides. And we get that our x is equal to 40. And that's it. We didn't have any parentheses to worry about in this one your exponents, so it was pretty simple. So for this next one, it involves a little bit of distribution, but I'll show you how to do that. So for this one, we can basically follow our reverse PEMDAS again. In this case, we have an x plus 6 in the denominator, so we've got to multiply by x plus 6 on both sides. You see when we do this, the numerator and denominator cancel out, so we're left with 55 equals x times x plus 6. Now we're going to have to distribute that x into the x plus 6, we basically have to multiply it both by the x and the 6. So we'll do x squared plus 6x, and we have that that equals to 55. Now, to solve this, we can move the 55 over to get it in the quadratic equation form. But let's say you don't know the quadratic equation. That's where Desmos can come in handy. Simply type this into Desmos, and wherever it crosses the x-axis, that's what the answer for x is. Whenever y equals 0, x will equal some value, and again, there will be two places where it crosses since it's a quadratic, but we're looking for the positive solution. So looking on Desmos, we see that the positive solution is x equals 5. We also have negative 11 as a solution, but that's negative, so that's not the one they're looking for. So we've dealt with a single linear equation now, but now we should also know how to deal with multiple equations at once. So how do we solve a system of linear equations? Now if you see any problem referencing the solution to a system of equations, just type that on Desmos and it'll do it for you. So basically, just type in these two equations, which I'll do right now. Their intersection point is where both of those things are true. So that'll give you an xy coordinate. So the coordinate that we get is 15, negative 45. And remember, we're looking for the value of x. Always be careful with that, whether they're looking for x or y or both. And we see that x is 15 in this case. Now, dimensional analysis is a really important skill, not just on the SAT, but also in real life. It's really great to be able to convert between different units quickly. And to do this in an organized fashion and make sure we don't miss anything, we can use dimensional analysis. So we want to write down the number we're starting with and figure out how to get where we want to go, what we want to end up with. So let's practice a simple dimensional analysis problem. We have a printer that produces posters at a rate of 42 posters per minute. And we want to convert that into how many posters can it do per hour. So, for this problem, you'll need to know that there are 60 minutes in an hour, but the way dimensional analysis works is you'll try to get the same unit to be diagonal to each other. So if we want to convert to posters per hour, we'll put minutes in the numerator so it cancels out, 
and we're left with posters per hour. Conversion for minutes to hour is there's 60 minutes in one hour. And doing this, we'll get 42 times 60 posters per hour, or 2,520. And if you need to do a quick double check, think about 42 posters getting printed per minute. There's gonna be a lot more per hour because an hour is a lot longer than a minute. So it makes sense that this number is so big. Doing that double check every time after a problem can really help you out and prevent you from making careless mistakes. So the next most common topic on the SAT is probably these percentages, proportions, and ratio type of question. This one's one of the more simple topics, but it's really important to make sure you're solid on this just because of how much it shows up. So you'll need to know the basics of percentages, proportions, and ratios, which are all similar ways to express probability. And we'll go through some examples here. So this is a very basic percentage problem, but just note that a percentage can be represented as its decimal form. So 10% is equivalent to 0.1 times the value. So 0.1 times 470 is 47. So this is the trickier type of probability question that you'll see. It's reading these tables and deciphering what they want you to pick out of the table. So you need to make sure that you're reading the right values for these. So the table gives the distribution of votes for a new school mascot and grade level for 80 students. If one of these students is selected at random, so that's the pool we're choosing from, is just all of the students, what is the probability of selecting a student whose vote for the new mascot was a lion? So we don't really care about grade level at all here. We just care about who wanted the lion in total. So in this case, we see grade level on top here, and we see the mascots here on this side. So for total number of students, we have 80. It even says that up there. So out of those 80 students, 20 wanted the mascot to be a lion. So those are the two numbers that we're working with. And always double check when you're doing these types of problems. So once we find those two values, it's pretty easy. If we want the probability of selecting only those students who picked lion, we can do the students who picked lion over the total students. That's how you find the probability. And that is equal to 1 fourth. So for the table questions, it'll usually just go what you want to pick over either the total or it'll give you like what's the percentage of total sixth graders who chose lion. And then you would choose sixth graders who chose lion over total sixth graders. So just be careful what it's asking for. And these ones are pretty straightforward. So those are five out of the 10 concepts that I think are the most important for the SAT math section. And we'll get into the next five next time. But in the meantime, feel free to check out Aisley using the link in my description below for $10 off your first month. And best of luck on your SAT. You're going to do amazing. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.